Welcome to our Niagara Peninsula Branch Ontario Ancestors webinar tonight. Um, I just want to remind everybody who you may or may not be a member, but um, it's always a great thing to be a member, uh, especially of the Niagara Branch. Um, we've got many, many benefits, including access to Niagara specific resources, assistance with breaking through your genealogy brick walls, and support uh, supporting projects that preserve Niagara's heritage. So if you aren't a member and want to become a member, please go to ogs.on.ca and join um, the general membership and then click off for the Niagara Peninsula branch to get access to those specific resources. Um, and I'll also point out that our master index um, for the Niagara branch is now on ancestry.com. So you may come across resources on Ancestry that link back to our uh, master index on our website at niagara.ogs.on.ca. And as well, you can sign up there for our newsletter, um, which comes out once a month and tells you all about what's going on in the branch, in the region, um, and uh, current research, upcoming webinars, uh, regional events, whole bunch of interesting stuff comes once a month. Um, and that's where you can sign up. Um, we've got two more interesting speakers coming up next month. In February, we've got Penny Walters, who will be talking about navigating the 1921 British Census. And in March, we have Jane McNamara, who will be talking about the process and paperwork involved in granting of Crown land. She'll be using specific examples from the Niagara region. Um, so if you haven't signed up for those webinars, please go to our website at niagara.ogs.on.ca. They're under events. Um, and I'm going to get now to our speaker, who's Jeanette from Jeanette's Genealogy. Welcome, Jeanette. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, Jeanette lives in Lockport, and she's been researching her family tree since 2002 and lecturing since 2011. She's had the privilege to speak for societies and libraries locally and virtually all over the world. She's the president of the Virtual Genealogical Association, which we were just chatting about and is fascinating. You should definitely go check out their website, virtualgenealogy.org. Um, and um, Jeanette's here to talk to us tonight about fultonhistory.com, which is one of my favorite websites ever uh, for genealogy. Uh, hopefully you've all had the chance to visit before, but now we'll get an in-depth look um, through Jeanette's eyes. So thank you for joining us tonight, Jeanette. Thank and I'm you. just going to hand off right here to you. That sounds good. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk to you guys again. It's been a couple of years, I think, since I've had the opportunity to, you know, I feel this connection because I'm in Niagara County, New York, just over the, <laughs> just so over the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys are over there. Yet you seem you're so close yet so far away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. When I do, my keynote really kind of takes over my screens, and I won't be able to see the chat. So Amanda, if anything comes up, if somebody's like, wait, 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 she needs to go back and do that again, please just go ahead and interrupt me, and we'll we'll go back and answer anything in media. And then if not, the rest of the questions can kind of just go in the chat area um, to save for the end. Absolutely, absolutely. So oh, yes, if you have any chat questions, by all means, um, just put them in the general chat and we'll make sure that they get forwarded to Jeanette. All right, how's that looking? Is that um, the main screen or not my presenter notes? It's there, it looks beautiful. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, as Amanda said, my name is Jeanette Shaliga and this is navigatingfultonhistory.com. And what we're gonna do tonight is we're going to go over a scope of the site's content. Then I'm gonna share some search options with you. We will look at the collection setup, you know, and then some Boolean searching, some more advanced searching techniques. And then I'm just going to share some search strategies with you. There is a handout, a link to it is in the chat. And I tried to connect the handout very closely with the presentation. So don't worry too much about like, writing that down, you know, if you've got the handout, you know, near you and everything like that, it should help, you know, reinforce what it is that I'm going over tonight without you having to take um, notes. 
I know that some of you guys have probably have come across this newspaper site before, and it might have been like, this is my favorite site ever, or like, this is the most hard to use site. I can't figure it out, you know, two thumbs down <laughs> or anything like that. And I hope that tonight's presentation is going to make you maybe turn those thumbs down to thumbs up because there's so much amazing content within this site that once you learn how to navigate it, you're really going to find a lot of newspaper articles that you were hoping to find. The site was created in 1999 by Tom Trinisky, and um, he has created it as a free site and it has been a free site since its creation back then. It started with him digitizing and posting old postcards from Fulton, New York, where he lives. And then he started adding local newspapers by hand scanning them on a flatbed scanner in like 2001 and 2000, 2000 and 2001. And it's just grown from there. And what I mean by grown from there, to start off with just sharing postcards, the website now has over 51 million newspaper pages from US and Canada. To put that a little bit in perspective, and these numbers are from this month, the Library of Congress for United States chronicling America has been digitizing newspapers for over a decade. They only have 20 million. And there's another website called New York State Historic Newspapers. They only have 11 million. If you were to add what the you know, national government was doing with the archives and what the New York State was doing with the libraries, that's just a little over double, um, a little over half of what one man has done by putting together 51 million pages. Now you're going to notice that it does say old newspaper pages from United States and Canada. However, I have gone through all of the folders and looked at the titles and I've only really found um, 13 newspaper titles from Canada, one from Australia, and one from the Bahamas. And so I don't want you to think like, whoa, 51 million, I, I, you know, and kind of think it says U.S. and Canada, maybe it's half and half. It, it, it really isn't. The bulk of what is digitized is um, of U.S. newspapers. For you guys, I wanted to share with you the titles that they have. And normally, you know, when it's copyrighted material like this, we say, please don't, you know, take any screenshots. But because I'd added in this slide just for you guys for Ontario, um, please go ahead and feel free to take a screenshot of this. These are the titles, those 13 titles from Canada that I was able to find. The third one down is in Lithuanian, so it's not English based, um, but you can see that um, sometimes when he was putting these titles in, he would specify Ontario and sometimes he would put CA for Canada, but CA is also the postal abbreviation for California. And so when he added newspapers on the site for California, they also received a CA. And so that's a little bit confusing there. For the rest of the ones you can see spelled out Ontario and Canada or BC is British Columbia. So those are the titles that um, are on the website for free for Canada. As I said, the bulk of the newspapers are United States based, and you will see here that I counted the titles and I arranged them by state. Because the website started in New York State, um, it has the largest collection of newspapers from New York State. So just over the bridge from you guys, there are 951 titles of the 775 that I created. So over half of the titles are from New York State alone. Then the other states you can see, the next state is Georgia, then Kentucky, Michigan, and so on. There, not all states have um, any newspapers represented from their state. You can see that at the end of the list. This is also in your handout. When you go to FultonHistory.com, this is the landing page that you are going to come to, and there's a fish that swims by and items like that. 
And the first um, option you want to click on to go into the site is number one, go and search my archives. To just give you a broad overview how you navigate the search page, you put a term into the search box, you hit search. Underneath that, the search results will show up. You select one of those hyperlinked titles and it will show a PDF of the you know, digitized image on the right hand side. Now, depending what browser and what version of Adobe, you know, and perhaps if you're on a Mac or PC, the Adobe controls that are reading the PDF might look different. I am on a Mac and this is showing me using my internet browser Safari. And when I mouse over the newspaper page, the zoom in and zoom out buttons show over at the bottom. Um, but then while I'm still on my Mac, but I'm using Chrome as my internet browser, the Adobe controls are at the top. So just kind of, you'll just have to navigate and figure out which one you have, then it should be the same each time that you use it. Fulton History uses optical character recognition or OCR. And this is where the computer reads the text on the page to return the search results to you. The newspaper images on the site mostly come from microfilm. So at one point, somebody took the original newspaper, you know, kind of laid it down, took a picture of it for the microfilm, turned the newspaper page, took a picture, you know, and they put all of those on, you know, the what the role of microfilm. The original microfilm was called the master negative, and then copies were made from that, and copies were made from that, and copies were made from that. The microfilms on the Fulton History website might be second or third generation films, you know, and so in doing so, there may be a lot of wear and tear or scratches and dirt that have come on, and this can make it difficult for the OCR to find the text to give those search results to you that you were hoping for. So we're going to go over a variety of different search options to help us navigate around this. To conduct a search, you'll type your search request into the prompted box, but before you hit search, you're probably going to want to adjust some of the search options that are available to you. I think the most important search option to talk about is this drop down here where it currently says Boolean. Underneath Boolean, you will see options for all of the words, any of the words, and the exact phrase. We're going to spend some time on Boolean later, so let's first look at the other three. If you were to select all of the words as your search option and say you are doing a search for bowling ball, um, this would return results that have both the word bowling and ball somewhere on that same newspaper page, but not necessarily next to each other. If you were to select any of the words, again, you know, it would have bowling and or ball somewhere on the page, but not necessarily next to each other. If you were to um, select the exact phrase, this would be the same as putting quotation marks around bowling ball as if you would on a Google search. And then those search results are only going to come back where the two words that you're, whatever the amount of words that you put in within the quotations, come back exactly as you, you know, had them within the quotations. However, you don't actually have to put the quotations in. If you have the exact phrase selected, when you hit search, the Fulton website will automatically put the quotations around what you put in the search box. You can put it in if you want. It's not going to hurt it. I just want you to know you don't have to. Probably the most frequent newspaper searching we want to do with our genealogy is looking up our ancestors by their names. So let's apply some of the different um, search types that we could do to Susan B. Anthony. She was an American woman's rights activist and an organizational leader of the women's suffrage movement. So if I was to select all of the words and I put Susan Anthony in the search box, 
you will see two previews of search returns that I received. The first one was from Albany, New York, and I said all of the words. So I said, I just want Susan and Anthony to show up on the page. And the search um, preview did, you know, the return preview does show that it has a Susan and I'm assuming Cooper and the word Susan is bolded in the return. And then there's some ellipses, some dot, dot, dot. And later somewhere on that newspaper page, they found the word Anthony. Um, but that's not an article that's going to be about the Susan B. Anthony that I was hoping to search. In the second search result um, comes from Boston, Massachusetts, and you can see where it says Susan B. Anthony there. And so that would be maybe more likely a newspaper article that I would want to click on to look at. Instead of all of the words, if you wanted to do any of the words, this is telling the computer, listen, I just want Susan and or Anthony to be somewhere on the page. And so you can see in the search return previews there that it does have in the first example from Kentucky where it found a Susan on there. And in the second one from Troy, New York, where they found an Anthony, but neither of them is the Susan Anthony that we were hoping for. So again, if you're searching for a name, you're probably going to want to stick to searching by the exact phrase. And again, you can put the quotations around or when you hit search, it will do it for you. And it shows two search returns here. The first one is from New York, and it says, hearing an address of Miss Susan Anthony of Rochester, one of the strong-minded women. Well, that sounds like my suffrage movement, Susan B. Anthony. And the second search return is from Texas, and it says, can surely vote. There's no doubt about it, and Susan Anthony will be supremely happy. Again, that that sounds like an article that I would be interested in. Now, a lot of us, you know, know Susan Anthony is Susan B. Anthony. And so I wanted to share with you that Fulton does allow for wild cards within their searching. And the two that I use the most are the asterisks and the question mark. You can go to the Fulton help page and find some other ones that are available. But honestly, you know, these two are enough for me. So if you have an asterisk, you're saying, any number of characters between, between, you know, where you put that asterisk in works. If you put a question mark, that's only a single character. Now, I chose to do Susan Anthony with the asterisk because I'm not certain if Fulton is going to count, you know, a lot of times people will have their middle initial and then a period after it. So is Susan, you know, B period, consider two characters or one in the eyes of this search engine. So I played it safe and put an asterisk. That way it's going to cover whether it, the newspaper just had her middle initial as B or a B with a period. Here's a search result that came back and you can see it shows, um, you know, with the asterisk, Susan B. Anthony, and then it was talking about Sacagawea. They um, had dollar coins made. Um, and then this one came back and you can see from the return preview, Susan Cobot Anthony. It did what I asked it to do. I said, give me any number of characters between Susan and Anthony. And sure enough, there was another person named Susan Anthony that had, well, actually, even looking at this, it says Susan Cobot, comma, Anthony. So it looks like these are two different people, um, you know, and it looks like maybe it's a horror film and those were the actors involved in it. And it just happened that they were near each other on the page. And then this search return came up, Susan R. Anthony. And it talks about who will address the ladies of this county. Well, that sounds like something the Susan B. Anthony I was searching for would do, but it says R and not B. You know, and this makes me question, is this perhaps a typo in the paper or did the OCR misread the R and the B and think it was an R? So I clicked on the title on the hyperlink to bring up the image. And sure enough, it was mistyped in the newspaper. It says Susan R. Anthony, but when you read the article, you know, it talks about the cause of women's right. I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, that's the same person that we are looking for.
Now, if the OCR was just misreading it, I want to share with you this article from Kenneth Marks of the ancestorhunt.com and a link to this article is in your handout and he talks about um, certain letters that when the OCR is reading them can mistake it for another letter so in the first one that he shows there if you have an, a word with r and n right next to it the OCR might accidentally think it's the letter M. Or um, the example under it is that H and B can commonly be you know, misread by the OCR. And what he suggests in this is to try doing searches by deliberately misspelling the, the criteria that you're searching for. So like your ancestor's name, try deliberately misspelling it for one of these and swap out a common, you know, letter that is misread um, by OCR. And he says that it helped him reach up to 20% more pertinent hits of articles that he hadn't found before. So that's an amazing little like, nugget there to take with you and you can apply that to you know beyond just um Fulton history you can use this idea with other sites that you would maybe be searching that is using OCR okay now there are other search options such as stemming and fuzzy searching but for this presentation we're going to skip over those and we're going to go down to the sort type and this is different I kind of want to clarify here up at the top, when we were talking about, you know, Boolean and all of the words, any of the words, the exact phrase, that is when you're telling Fulton um, how you want it to search. Now, when I'm going down to the sort type, I am going to be asking, they're telling the computer, this is how I want my search results to come back to me. So it's two different options for you to select, but it's going to help you organize all of the returns that you get. So the sort type determines the order in which the search results are displayed. There's a couple options. There's hits. And with this, this is where the site believes that it's matching the search criteria the best to this particular article. And so I did a search for Michael White and I had the sort type selected as hits. And you can see on the right hand side, there was, um, you know, showing me one of 500 of 2000 search returns. And then on the table, it has a column where it has like 100%, 81%, 81%. And so it organized the search returns by putting what it thought was the best one at the top. However, just looking at the preview, I'm not seeing a difference between how the computer came up with 100% for the first search return versus 81% for the other ones. So this type of sorting is not my favorite. When you select date, you might be like, yes, this is perfect. It's going to put all the newspapers in chronological order when they were published and everything like that, sadly. I'm sorry to say that's not what it means. <laughs> um, what it is showing you, though, is the order in which the newspapers were added to the Fulton site with the newest first. And if you look at the preview box boxes, you can see the first search return was uploaded on October 12, 2015. The second one and third one was October 11th, 2015. So again, that's not very helpful when you're trying to search for your ancestors. Personally, I like selecting name as the option that I want my search returns to come back. And what it's going to do is it's going to put all the newspaper titles in alphabetical order A to B to C. You know, so if I'm coming up with um, big cities, you know, it's probably going to show me Albany, New York first, and then Buffalo, and then, you know, Bo or well, Boston, then Buffalo going alphabetical, then maybe Chicago, you know, showing me the, the, the places that the newspapers were alphabetized, you know, in order. But let me show you this result. So I did, you know, my search for Michael White, and I selected name, and you're going to see that 
um, the first search return is Webster, New York, and then it starts to show the A's for Albany. And, and if you were to scroll down, eventually you would leave Albany and go to Avon and, you know, just kind of all different places. And the reason why is there's a slight typo when this particular newspaper out of Webster was uploaded to the site a period was placed prior to the W. And so, you know, just like when you have anything, then the numbers kind of go first and then the, the punctuations and then the alphabet. So that's why this one is slightly out of order. It's just a typographical error. And while we're on that subject, you're gonna find a few typographical errors on the website. Shown here is an example in the newspaper. You can see it's called the Steuben Advocate. However, when it was created, the folder was created to put all those images in there, the V out of Advocate was left out. And then in the other example, there's the Genoa Tribune, but um, in the folder that it was placed in, an extra I was added to make it kind of Genoia. Um, so I want you to just keep these in mind because later when we're going to start doing some Boolean searching, you have to match how the site calls it and not how it's properly spelled. So if you were going to be doing a search for the Genoa Tribune, you would have to actually do a search for Genoia, okay? And that's a little bit more advanced. I just wanna throw it out there so that you're aware of it. Okay, now we've gone over kind of like how you search. Let's go on to, you know, kind of to the back room and see how all of the files are organized, okay? Let's see how the site is set up. To do that, we're gonna go into number two, go and browse my archives. And when you do that, you're gonna to come to this page that has all these different file cabinets. And the very first one is titled, Historical Newspapers United States and Canada. That's where the 51 million newspaper pages are in there. They're in that file cabinet, okay? And so you wanna click into that, and it's gonna bring you to a sign on um, little screen and you can just sign up for a free account. Um, the only reason why he did that was that bots were scraping the site and just taking thousands and thousands of newspaper pages all at you know once and it was slowing the bandwidth down for other members to use it. So by creating this little bit of a wall to have real people get into the um, where the files are kept versus um, bots, you know, kind of crawling the web there and, and taking the content is how he got around that. And I am just going to mute for just a second so I can blow my nose, I hope. Mute. Okay. No. So here we are. We have opened up the file cabinet drawers, and then there's folders, just like you would in a file cabinet. Ignore the first couple ones, but then you're going to see that it has all these different newspapers from different places, and we're in the A's. And so if you look at the top, there are 29 pages of all these folders that have the different newspaper titles there. To navigate them, and this is alphabetical, you have to use these teeny tiny arrows at the top to go forward. So if you wanted to look at see what newspapers, you know, begin from a place that's the letter T, you're going to have to keep on arrowing over until you get there in the alphabet. There's no easy way, you know, to go from page one to page 20, for example. So I went ahead and I kept clicking that right arrow all the way to page 29. And the very last newspaper folder that was in that file cabinet was the Yonkers New York Statesman. So I'm going to take that folder out of the file cabinet because I want to see what's inside. So I open that folder. And when I do, I see all these subfolders. These are, you can see just by looking at it, are different years. And so the first folder has the newspapers from 1863 to 1865. The next one is the folder from 1869 to 1871 and so on. And then eventually you start to see that um, there's only one year per, per folder. Each of these folders represents 
a roll, a reel of microfilm. And so the earlier newspapers were often a lot shorter and they could fit a span of years, especially if they only published once a week or something like that versus you know when it gets to the 20th century and you know the newspapers are much longer and especially the sunday editions where they even microfilmed all the ads you know can be a hundred pages per issue and so they can fit fewer editions on one reel of film so what i want to do is i want to like look inside the 1890 subfolder and i want to look at what's inside there and if you click on that folder it then takes you to a page that looks like this each one of these pdfs is a pdf from that microfilm of the digitized content so you know um, if we go back, you know, at some point somebody laid the newspaper down, they took a picture of it, and they put that on the reel of microfilm. What he did then is he took that microfilm and he took that image and made it into a PDF. And so every single page of the newspaper gets its own PDF. And so these are all the newspaper pages from this newspaper for 1890. And if you wanted to like, oh, I didn't mean to go to 1890, I wanted 1889, you can up arrow to get out. Um, I think it's better than doing a, um, using your back in the browser because I think that takes you all the way back to like the, the 29 pages. Um, and so you can see here that on this one, we are looking at one and there is a five in brackets. There are five pages of these PDFs to equal um, the one year of newspapers from Yonkers. So I wanted to show you how the file naming system on Fulton was done. This is gonna be really important because it's gonna help you on how to search later on when we get into the Boolean. You can see each PDF is named and numbered. It starts with the place that the newspaper was published, then the title of the newspaper, the year that it was published, and then each image that he took off the reel, he just started numbering them chronologically. One, two, three, four, five. And when I went all five pages of the Yonkers Statesman from 1890, there are 1,204 different images for this newspaper for this year alone. So I wanted to show you what happens. If you were to click on one, for example, I clicked on 0003 PDF, it opens then up the PDF of his scan of the newspaper. And then you can see the whole page. You can zoom in and out to look carefully at it. You might notice on the right hand side that the last column is cut off and you might be like, oh, no, that's where my article is that I was hoping to read. Um, emailing Tom Trininsky at Fulton History is not going to fix this. That's how the image was taken when it was put on the microfilm. And so unfortunately, he doesn't have a better quality, you know, of that particular page to show you that last column that was cut off. And, you know, somebody had mentioned, and I think that's probably really true, this newspaper might have been bound. I don't know if you've ever seen, they're huge, you know, when they bind full newspapers flat, and then you open up the book, and then sometimes, you know, depending on how tight the binding is, you can't quite get to the seam in the middle. Perhaps when they microfilmed that, that's how this newspaper was. What you can do then, at least you know the article is there, and then you can, you know, like, well, maybe this local history society, you know, um, might have a copy of it or the originals, you know, something like that. You can start to search other places um, to see if you can find a different version of it. When I go to PDF 0007, I was brought to the title page of the Yonkers Statesman, and it was Saturday afternoon, January 4th, 1890. It says underneath the word Yonkers, it's a daily journal um, in the interest of Westchester County. And so I'm like, cool, there's the first page. I'm curious, though, to learn more about this. It says, you know, it's a daily journal. So I know that it's in the, it's, it was printed in the afternoon. You know, sometimes newspapers would have like a morning and evening edition. You know, I, I don't know that. And how many pages is this newspaper? So I clicked out of that and I went to the next you know, that I was at 0007, so I go to 0008, and that takes me to the second 
page of this newspaper. And what I notice about it is that it's not one of those papers that has the title and the page numbers across the top. It did have the title in the upper left hand corner. But you know, if I was still wondering how many pages this newspaper would be, you know, I'm going to have to go to the next one. So I went from eight to page nine, and I started to see classified. So I was like, Oh, I think we're getting back towards the end of the paper, this might be a, a shorter newspaper. And I went to page 10. And I saw legal notices. And I'm like, Oh, this definitely feels like this is a, you know, four page newspaper. And sure enough, PDF 11 brought me to the next title page, which was the Yonker Statesman on Monday, January 6. So there's only four pages in link for this newspaper. So looking at the PDFs, I started with 0007. That was Saturday, January 4th, which was page one of that newspaper. Um, PDF 8 was page 2, PDF 9 was page 3, PDF 10 was page 4, and then PDF 11 was page 1 of Monday, January 6th. The next issue, maybe, I wasn't sure. How did we go from Saturday to Monday? You know, a couple ideas you know, come in mind. Um, maybe they don't publish on Sunday. Some papers would take Sunday off. Maybe it was missing when they microfilmed it, you know, and it didn't get there. Maybe it was microfilmed out of order. So I went to the United States National Archives um, Library of Congress, where they have Chronicling America, and they have a newspaper directory. And I looked up the Yonkers Statesman, and it did say that it was free, um, frequently published daily except Sunday. So that answered my question. It's not missing. It just was not made at the time of the, the issues were put out. So sadly, though, that's not the case. And, and there are missing issues that you might come across. I want to show you this little um, example here. And I have my second great grandfather, Felix McGinnity here. And he died February 9th, 1916. And I wanted to find his obituary. And I had done a lot of different searching and the you know search results. And I just wasn't finding it. And so I was like, you know what? Let me just go find out what's going on. So I went into the archives and I found where he lived in Randolph, New York. And there was a folder that had, you know, the newspapers from 1915 to 1916 within that folder. I'm like, great. Maybe the OCR just smudged and it can't read Felix's name. And that's why I'm not getting a search result. So I opened it up in the folder, which started, as it says, in 1915. So I had to go through quite a few PDFs. I would kind of just scroll, click on one, close it, scroll, click on one, until I got to PDF number 0571. And I found that that was January 21st, 1916. Felix died February 9th, so I was definitely a couple weeks away. And I knew, you know, based off of what I read on the title page, that the Randolph Register was a weekly newspaper, and it had H eight pages in each edition. So I knew that if January 21st <laughs> was, you know, PDF um, 0571, if I counted over eight PDFs that when I got to um, PDF number 0579, that that would be the next title page. And sure enough, it was. It was the January 28th edition. I'm like, great, I'm going to count eight more. So I'm like, okay, 79, 80, 81, 82, you know, and I get to 87, which should be the next title um, for, you know, page. And it was, but it skipped a couple weeks to February 18th. And I'm like, wait a minute here. And I'm like, did I count the eight pages right? I used all my fingers. I wasn't sure. And I even pulled up a calendar off of the stevemorris.org website, which showed um, the 1916 dates. And I found that the Randolph paper was um, printed on Fridays. And I had you know, January 21st, and then I had January 28th. But February 4th and February 11th, were missing. And then the next one I found was February 18th. And I looked at the PDF numbers and sure enough, you know, it was 0571 plus eight was 0579 plus eight, 79 plus eight brought me to 87. And so it was, it just wasn't there. And, you know, it could have been microfilmed out of order, but 
I, I wasn't sure, you know, like I just wasn't getting the search results if it was microfilmed out of order. I was leaning towards maybe that the newspaper didn't exist. However, one of the search returns that I received was um, at the end of the year in December 29th, 1916. This particular paper was doing like a year in review. And, you know, I've seen that on a lot of different papers, you know, 10 years ago on this date, 25 years ago on this date. Well, this paper did a year in review and it said from their February 11th edition, it mentions Felix McGinnity, another pioneer of the township of Randolph, died early Wednesday evening at his home near this village. And so there was a paper for the 11th, and he did die on Wednesday the 9th, and so it had his obituary there in the 11th, but I wasn't finding it. What happened was is that those two issues just weren't microfilmed. And so the the search was not returning it because it, it wasn't there. And then knowing that because I went into the archives and, and found that those issues were missing, I was then able to adjust my research plan to stop going to Fulton, you know, like basically I was just spinning my wheels. I kept trying to do other searching and it was wasting my time. It wasn't there. I was then able to change my research plan to be like, okay, who else might have this newspaper? And I, um, on a day off or a summer or something, I drove down to Randolph and at their local library, they had surname folders, like vertical files. And sure enough, they had the original clipping from Felix's obituary. And it even says the RR, the Randolph Register, February 11th, 1916. And it was a one wonderful obituary, not just like a couple sentences, but it had so much about when he arrived, where he was born, his siblings that still lived in Ireland, items that I had not found anywhere else. So it does have a happy ending, you know, and, and as I'm just repeating, you know, don't be afraid to change your research plan to try different avenues if Fulton is not getting you what you're hoping for. I want to do another little mini case study here um, where I was trying to find an obituary for Joseph Fiegel. And I had found on Find a Grave that he had died July 28th, 1887. I knew from doing searches on Fulton that his name uh, was coming up a lot in this newspaper called the Amherst Bee. And so I, I was like, well, he's mentioned a lot. His wife is mentioned why aren't I getting his, you know, obituary from when he died in 1887? I could see search returns, you know, started in 1886, you know, and then it went to 1900. And so I figured it would be in there. I went into the archives and I found that the Amherst Bee had two folders. The first one, it had 1879 to 1881. And then the second folder went 1879 to 1912. Well, if he died in 1887, I'm thinking that his obituary is going to be in that second folder. So I opened up the second folder and I started going through all the, the PDFs and I found that they were, you know, numbered by year, just as we've gotten used to his filing system. And it had 1883 to 1886. And the last one for that year was PDF number 00572. And I'm like, great. The next one is going to be 1887. And when I looked, the very next PDF jumped all the way to year 1900. What happened is, in my opinion, is that instead of having one big folder that had two different microfilms that he put into there, he, he should have separated them out. He should have said, here's a folder I've got for the newspapers from 1883 to 1886. Here's a folder I have of the Amherst Bee from 1900 to wherever it, it ended. Unfortunately, though, he put them both in the same folder and said, hey, look, I've got the newspapers from 1879 to 1912, and it's misleading because he's actually missing all of the newspapers from 1887 to through 1889. And so once again, by investigating the archives, I was able to um, change my research plan and start to think like, where else might I find copies of the Amherst B around? Maybe they're still printing. Maybe I can go to them and see if they have it in their archives. 
to summarize, you know, if you can't find what you're looking for, investigate if Fulton has the newspaper and then check in there to see if the year of the event you are looking for is in there. And then if you're still not getting it, check the additions to see if there's any missing additions. If the additions are there and you can't read it, perhaps it's, or you, you're not getting the search returns, perhaps it's an OCR issue. And then, you know, just start at each PDF and read the newspaper as if you were holding it in your hand. And hopefully you can find um, the missing article you were expected to find there. All right. Now, you guys ready? Okay. We're gonna look at some variations of Boolean searching. Now, Boolean can be a little bit intimidating. I promise you, I'm gonna show you some easy examples that are really gonna be super powerful for you. And you're gonna find your time on Fulton to be so much more easily to navigate. So when you're doing a search, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have Boolean selected if you're gonna be doing a Boolean search. The first Boolean search I'm, operator I'm going to show you um, I call words near each other. In this example I have Patrick within one of Larkin and to do the within I put a W then slash and then a number and with that W slash just means you've got your first word and then within this amount of the second word we're going to search for them that way and so um, with Patrick W slash one Larkin, I received search returns like this. Now in the first one, you can see that this there was a comma in between them and it looks like it was definitely like a list of names. And it's just coincidental that um, a Robert Larkin was in the paper next to a Patrick Hodgson. Hodge sin. <laughs> um, and, but it did do what I asked it to do. I asked for any time you found Patrick within one word of Larkin, and it did that. The next search return, it does show Patrick Larkin next to each other. And so that is definitely the obituary of, you know, uh, his uh, wife. No, yeah, his wife. And so with this, you might be like, well, why would I want to just do one? occasionally in newspapers they do have some sort of lists that are last name comma first name but you know you could just do an exact well not an exact phrase because it would do patrick larkin and not larkin patrick but you know this is just to spring you off because you don't have to just select um one word apart, you can increase that number to five, you can increase it to 10, you know, you can say, I want this word to be, you know, 17 words, you know, within the second word. And I'm going to show you an example of why this works. In this um, obituary, and I put in the pixelated one on purpose, because this is real life, and newspapers sometimes aren't that easy to read. And so I wanted to show you, you know, in this example, his last name is far away from his first name. So we've got his last name Larkin, and then they have all these words in between. In this city, May 29th, 1926, then his first name, Patrick. If you were doing just a search, for Patrick Larkin in the exact phrase with quotation marks, this newspaper obituary would never come back as a search term, you know, search return because the his first and last name was so far spread apart from each other, you know, that you would need to expand the words near each other to grab it. So a lot of times I will just do a search with the W slash 10, you know, in there to really provide for some words in between if I'm looking for a particular article that I'm not finding. Um, also, just you know, keeping this in mind, um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but notice how Patrick is also hyphenated. That could be messing with the OCR a little bit too. Usually the OCR can pick up hyphenated, but between you know the pixelation of this one, the hyphenization, you know, there's a couple of things that you know would make this one be a little bit more difficult to come up in search returns. The second Boolean I'm going to talk about is the word 
and. And I want you to think kind of like a Venn diagram. You know, if I wanted to do a search for President and Roosevelt, I can do a Boolean search and just put the word and in between them. And it's going to bring back those search results. But again, similar to when we did like um, all of the words, they won't necessarily be next to each other. They're going to be on the same place. This might be a useful if you were to do it, you know, by using different search parameters. Instead of like, you know, president and name, you could try a name in a place. Perhaps, you know, put in a unique surname in a place that they lived, and it would search the page for that place. Or you could try a name and a date, and that date would have to be printed on the newspaper, which it often is across the title or something like that. You know, that could maybe narrow down when you would find an obituary. Um, you could do a name and an event. You know, you could do a surname and the word died or funeral or obituary or cemetery and it could you know possibly bring those up they they'll be on the page but not necessarily next to each other and then you could also do two different surnames for this example this was another one where the first name was I don't know, like eight words away from the surname, you know, so it started with Whitaker suddenly in this city, February 24th, 1926, you know, John. So his first name and last name were quite far apart. I actually found this one because I did a search for his surname and then I put the word and in my Boolean and I did another unique surname that I thought would be mentioned in the obituary because it was his sister sister's married last name, you know, that she might be mentioned as being survived as, you know, of, of him. And it worked. See, Boolean's not that hard, right? Okay, so we're going to get a little bit harder, but I got you, okay? We, we got this. Okay, so in this example, I'm showing Clarence Webb, and I did an exact phrase search for this. And that brought back 1,863 results of newspapers. And I don't have the time to go through 1,800 of news results. So I kind of thought about it and I'm like, I know he lived the you know last 10 years or so of his life in Elmira, New York. So I want to narrow my search results to just newspapers from Elmira. So I went into the archives and I paged, you know, through the 29 pages until I got to the E's. And I found that Fulton has four different newspaper titles, all from El Elmira, New York. And you can see that they are all spelled identical. Because remember when we talked about those typographical errors? This is where that comes in important because if one of those Elmira's perhaps had a Y instead of an I, um, it wouldn't pull up the results. So, but luckily all of these Elmira's were spelled identical. So my Boolean search now is going to mix a couple different factors. I want to search for Clarence Webb. And because I'm doing Boolean and not exact search or exact phrase, I am going to put the quotation marks around his name. I'm going to put Clarence Webb in quotation marks. Then I'm going to add the Boolean and, okay, I want to find exactly Clarence Webb, but also I want the search results to come back for only being papers from Elmira in New York. And the way to do that is you do an open parentheses, file name contains another open parentheses, Elmira, New York, and you could just put Elmira without the New York, but if there's an Elmira in another state, it would pull those up too. And then you have to close both sets of parentheses. If you don't close them both, it's not going to come back exactly right. And so with that, I've got Clarence Webb in quotations, and is my Boolean. And then I just want to find the newspapers from Elmira. And I put that in the search is as it is. And please know that you don't have to use capital letters. Um, you can use all lowercase. It, that doesn't, that won't affect your search. And I've got my Boolean selected. And I went from having searches of 1863 down to 17. And that's so much more manageable, so much easier 
you know, a better way to spend my time. And if you look, it did do exactly what I asked because the search returns showed the first newspaper was the Elmira, New York Morning Telegram. And then the second search result was the Star Gazette. And this is useful because a lot of times if something, an event happens in a region, multiple newspapers will publish articles about the same event. And what's really neat is a lot of times they might have different details between them. And so you want to just not grab one point of view of the event. You want to grab all the points of views so that you can put them together. With this file name contains like search operator we're using, we don't have to just do it by the, the place where the newspaper came from. You can change out where I had Elmira, New York to be a year. And this goes with how he named his files. So if we remember, you know, it would be Elmira, New York, and then the name of the newspaper, and then he had the years, right? And so you're just telling the computer, listen, I want exactly Clarence Webb, my Boolean is and, but I only want you to pull back files that contain the year, the number 1911 in their file name. And so that's really useful because if a person, you know, perhaps again, I used obituary a lot, say they got married and it was a big wedding, you might not know, you know, how far newspapers published that event. You know, in this search example here, the search results shows the first one from Chicago, Illinois. And that might be my Clarence Webb's, Mrs. Clarence Webb's sister of the groom, you know, that might be my family, you know, that traveled to Chicago or something, but I would have never thought to look in Illinois for that event, you know, so by changing not just the place, but the when can give you certain search results that are perhaps outside of where it was that you were looking. I can even do you one better. If you're not sure of when the event is, the file name contains will allow you to do a search for a range of years. And so I don't know how he does it, but with his file names, the way it is, you would do, you know, Clarence Webb or whatever your name is, and you don't have to use quotation marks, you can just use a single word, whatever, the Boolean and, then the open parentheses, file name contains open parentheses, put in your year of range, the years of range there with two tildes in between, and then double close your parentheses, and um, that will bring back results in this example from 1910, 1911, 1912, 1913, and 1914. You know, this is great. So if you see someone in a census, and then in the next census or directory or whatever, you know, a years later, it shows that they're not there, you can then narrow down that range that you're looking for to perhaps find out when the person passed away. You can connect these Booleans together, you know, so in this example, and this is when you get comfortable, you know, I wanted to just find Nelson, exactly Nelson, and Johnson. And, you know, because sometimes he used his middle name, middle initial or not, I could have done it, you know, words within each other, I could have done that, you know, but, you know, I just did it this way. There's lots of different ways you can get to the same results. So Nelson and Johnson, and I only wanted newspapers from Brockton, New York. So I put file name contains Brockton, New York, and file name contains 1906, because I really just wanted to find his obituary. And that was the year that he died. And so you can piece these different booleans together by using the word and and it can really like narrow down all of the you know search returns that you got there you know in the hundreds and thousands to more just what it was exactly that you're looking for and if once you get uh, comfortable with those you know go into his um help area there are some other you know styles of Boolean searches that you can try within there and everything like that, you know, but start, start simple, pick one that you're comfortable with and then, you know, build from there. I wanted to share in kind of my last segment with you some search strategies 
you know, as much fun as it is to sometimes just randomly search, um, I know I need objectives to help me stay on task and I tend to accomplish more when I do, you know, so create an objective. And this could be, you know, if you're looking for a birth, marriage or death or an event or an employment or family connections, you know, so-and-so went to visit their aunt. Um, you wanted to look up their friends, associates and neighbors, their fan club, you know, look for other people, you know, so create a question even if you need to you know put it on a sticky note you know today i'm doing this i want you to find an obituary for great grandpa well start to think about you know some things that might help besides great grandpa's name you know like do you have an approximate when the event happened do you have an approximation as to where it happened you know what newspapers might have been in the area that great grandpa lived what was the name of the cemetery or the church he attended? You know, who else might be listed in his obituary that you could use to help, you know, um, manipulate the searches in case you weren't finding what it was you hoped for on your first try. And then I like to create a search log. And I know people are like, yeah, yeah, research logs and everything, but I don't know about you. I forget all the time what I've been doing and I will do something and then a few days later I will repeat that same search and you know that's just wasting my time in this instance I was looking for an obituary of John Sackle he died in Lockport where I live um October 1st 1916 so I started off by putting John Sackle in the search box I had um exact phrase selected and it brought me back 142 results and those newspapers ranged all the way from 1902 to 1960. I didn't want every article I could find on John Sackle. I just wanted his obituary and I knew he died in 1916. So I changed the search from exact phrase to Boolean and I did John Sackle in quotation marks and then my file name contains 1916 and that took that 142 down to eight hits and I found the obituary and not only did I find it in the Lockport newspapers there was one in Buffalo that I had no idea it was there and if I had just done a search for the file name in Lockport I wouldn't have found that article out of Buffalo so you know doing a search log can be helpful other search strategies, don't forget to use those wild cards we talked about, switching out the characters for the OCR, try searching by an ancestor's address and don't even have their name in there at all. Try searching by initials. If you're looking for a female, search by her husband's name, such as like Mrs. Felix McGinnity. Um, try adding a hyphen in a name if um, you know there was an area where that particular name would have been easily hyphenated to see if that helps you. And then lastly, I want to talk about creating a source citation. Again, I have repeated mistakes over and over, and I found an article on Fulton, and then I could not find it again. And had I just copy and pasted the information I needed, you know, I would have saved myself literally hours of going to try to find that article again. So creating a source citation, what you typically do is you want to start with the title of the article, the name of the newspaper, when it was published, what page, and what column. Okay, that's just any typical, you know, evidence explained Chicago style that we use for um, genealogy. And then to continue it, you want to say where you found it. Well, in this case, it was a digital image, which I found on the old Fulton New York Postcards website. And I put the address of, you know, the web address, the date that I found it. And then lastly, this is a little extra I add. Um, I add in the historical newspapers, United States and Canada, the big file cabinet. And then within that file cabinet, I copy and paste the name of the, the hyperlink. And I put that at the end of my citation. And that's key. And if you copy paste that into your research log or anything like that, they're hyperlinked. You can click on that in your Word document or Google Doc, and it should take you right back to that article. And knowing exactly what the name of that PDF is can also help you if you have found an article, but it might say like continued on the next page. And you're like, how do I get to the next page? So let me show you real quick how you turn a page. 
so for you know in this example um i knew that um the pdf ending in 0126 was page four and so you know you can copy paste the the whole file the pdf into the search box and change you know so that you've got the exact phrase selected and when you do i knew page four Four of the newspaper was PDF 0126. All you have to do then is change it to the PDF number prior 0125 or 0127. And you want to go like a couple pages, you know, um, just change the digit because we know he put his files numbered, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so that's how you can easily turn the page with the exact phrase, you hit search, and it's going to pull up um, the page prior to what it was that you were looking for. I hope that some of these techniques were new to you. I know that some of you have spent a lot of time on this website, and you're maybe like, well, um, you know, I hadn't tried it that way, but I've done that one before, you know, and I, I, I hope that it becomes um, a favorite website of yours as it is mine. And once you can navigate it, um, you know, the possibilities are just endless on the amount of newspapers that you can find. So thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and then we can have some time for questions. That was fantastic. I learned a whole bunch of new things. So thank you very much, Jeanette, for, for joining us. I do see one question um, from Molly Charbonneau. She's asking whether these um, tips will work on FultonSearch.org. Mm -hmm. So FultonSearch.org is not run by the guy that does Fulton History. And whoever has been managing Fulton Search has not taking care of it in years and you can do a search what it does is it search searches the archives you know like um and it was it used to be a little bit more user friendly however once you bring up the search results and you go to click on it it used to take you to the newspaper page now you get this like 404 um web internet error and like the links don't work anymore um and so uh, unfortunately i find it's just easier right to go to fulton history rather than fulton search i used to use fulton search and now it's just not it hasn't been upkept okay um denise says that she doesn't know how to screenshot is there any other way to obtain a list of the canadian newspapers we will i'm just going to know be posting the um the video of this webinar in our um members only section so if you are a member you will have the opportunity to go back and review the video um and i can probably post if, if it's okay with you a list of those newspapers in the um let me try it in the chat there they are Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> um, a lot of fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this excellent presentation from Wanda. She learned a lot. Uh, best explanation of Boolean searching that I've ever heard from <laughs> Edith. That's fantastic. Um, oh, and Molly has come back to say that she's agreed with you. She just wanted to check. Uh, great presentation. Are there any other? Oh, Jan, I see you have a question. Do you want yes, to I'm unmuted. Yes, there you yes. are. I think so. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just it is easier just to to say it rather than type it. When yep. you were talking about the the newspapers in Elmira and who you were looking for in Elmira, and you were saying how okay there were four different newspapers and um you know the stories might be a little bit different in the different papers it might also be because one was a morning edition one was an afternoon edition one was an evening edition so you know as the day goes on they may be gathering more details or more details may be available as time goes on during the same day so you know it it you know, don't be afraid to check. I mean, don't limit yourself to just one newspaper when you find an article. Check those other ones because you might get, you know, those details that are missing that yes. you'd like to have. 
That's very, very true. Yes, I, I know I found that myself, uh, especially if you uh, have relatives who have um, have been local, but have also lived somewhere else. You might find, um, like I have Canadian relatives who moved to New York and the New York obituary is huge. And then there's a little mention in say the Hamilton newspaper about them as well, but not as much in detail. Um, again, a, a few more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. I would note as well that I saw uh, that you, you said to use an address um, in your search. And I found that that's been very helpful for me, just even typing the last name and the, and the name of the street sometimes will bring up something that, um, that you didn't expect to find. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, Steve wanted me to mention um, that Canadian events, and it's true, I found this as well, Canadian events were often uh, mentioned in the Niagara New York newspapers as well. So you may find mentions of your relatives or Canadian news in the uh, Buffalo or uh, Niagara area newspapers. Um, oh, and then uh, Ron Springsteen has said he's particularly liked your use of file name and Boolean searches on the on the site. So thank you very much. I think this was a very informed, this was, I mean, it was everything I hoped for. Yay! <laughs> so, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, and we will, as I said, be again next month. Um, we've got a couple more presentations coming up uh, in February. We've got Penny Walters coming to talk to us about navigating the 1921 British census. And in March, uh, Jane McNamara is going to talk to us about the process and paperwork involved in granting of Crown land using specific examples from Niagara region. You can join us for those. Just pop over to niagara.ogs.on.ca and uh, hit events to see those um, and, and register. And just a reminder to everyone that last year you were able to register for all the events at once. Um, this year, you'll have to register independently for each webinar as they come up. Um, so make sure that you're keeping, uh, keeping up to date on those. And if you uh, want to stay on, on, the, on the news with that, check out our newsletter, um, which you can also sign up for there. Again, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for having me. Hope your cold gets better. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll uh, we'll definitely have this video up soon um, for anybody who happened to miss pieces of it and wants to review. So thank you very much for joining us. Have a good night.